This video is the first in a series about photographing scale models. Rather than starting this series with the typical approach, Book 1, Chapter 1, The Camera, I want to let the image we need as modelers dictate the path through the myriad of hardware choices and information. And I hope this approach will keep these videos concise and to the point. But by the same token, these videos aren't meant to be the last word on the subject. So I strongly encourage you to explore additional information. There are several basic considerations with any photographic image. The most obvious is the subject and how it's composed. Second is the technical quality of the image. And third, how we record and store the image. Because photography is a process, these elements intertwine and become part and parcel of the final result. In general, photographing scale models falls under the purview of macro photography. Because we're usually photographing relatively small objects, we need to be able to focus in closely to optimize the size of the subject within the field of the camera. And in order to maximize documentation, we also want to have as much of that field be in focus. These are basic functions of the lens and camera, and I'll talk about them further in the next video. In this video, I want to focus on the variables that make a difference in the quality of the digital negative. In other words, how we record and how we store the digital data that makes up our current form of a photographic negative. Consider that the greatest amount of effort in photographing a scale model is in the setup. Background, lighting, and camera setup take a lot of time, and I'm not particularly fond of doing it over and over again. So I always record and store my images in a way that allows me maximum use. But before you push the button, you need to decide on how you're going to record the image. Digital cameras record an image as a file on some sort of medium, generally a magnetic card. Think of this file as the digital negative. Like any photographic negative, we want to capture as much information as possible. In the digital world, this is controlled in two ways. First, with the exposure settings of the camera, and second, by how much information we choose to keep. Exposure is primarily controlled by the amount of light on the sensor, and secondarily by adjusting the optimum recording range, or sensitivity of the sensor. The amount of light on the sensor is controlled by setting the aperture of the lens and the shutter speed. The recording range is set by adjusting the sensitivity of the sensor through the ISO adjustment. The higher the ISO number, the less light is needed on the sensor, but the greater amount of digital noise. Digital noise is more readily apparent in the dark areas of an image. Looking at the outlined area of two images, one exposed at ISO 100 and the other at 1600, you can see the increase in digital noise with the image exposed at 1600. Every camera handles high ISOs differently, but as a general rule, you pay more for better low light capability. When photographing models, movement isn't an issue, so I usually use an ISO of 100 or 200 to keep digital noise to a minimum. How much information we keep is controlled by how we tell the camera to save the file. Cameras use two basic file formats, JPEG and RAW. Within these formats, there can be additional variations. And while the JPEG is the most common, I think looking first at the RAW format will give a better understanding of what happens in the camera when you save an image as a JPEG. A RAW file is basically what the name implies. It's the raw data from the sensor. There's no compression of the file, so you're getting the maximum the camera can deliver. Also included in the file is additional metadata that tells the processing software how to handle the raw file. Some of this you set in the camera when you tell the camera how to render the color and set the white balance. However, when shooting in RAW, these settings are only a guideline for the software, so you still have access to all the data the camera saved about the image. This is very important when it comes to working with the image later. The unfortunate aspect of RAW files is that they are specific to a manufacturer and camera model. To open and process a RAW file, you either need the manufacturer's specific RAW converter or a third-party software that's compatible with your camera. So here's the bugger. 
You either rely on the camera manufacturer to provide a well-written bit of software, or you need to make sure that your third-party application supports your camera. This dependency on specific software is a factor when you think about long-term storage of a RAW file. What happens five years from now when your operating system no longer supports your camera's RAW converter? All those images become useless. So if you shoot RAW like I do, you should settle on a scheme of storage that works for you. One method is to convert all RAW files to DNG. DNG is Adobe's answer to a universal RAW file. The DNG converter is a free application available from Adobe. While it's certainly a workable alternative, DNG hasn't met with wide acceptance in the photographic community. Since most photographers seem to rely on third-party software, they've counted on each new release to maintain the support for the older cameras, and that's pretty much what I do. I usually just save the original RAW file along with the final image that was created. The major advantage of a RAW workflow, though, is that adjustments made in the image while in the RAW converter are non-destructive. When you open a RAW file with a typical processing software, you'd be faced with a number of panels and tabs containing with what appear to be a myriad of adjustments, many of which are similar to a standard image editor but with one very important difference. All edits made here are non-destructive. Any adjustments made in the RAW file are stored either within the file's metadata or as a separate sidecar file, so they can always be undone at any future date. At first glance, the amount of adjustments can seem daunting, and every software package is different, so you'll need to do your homework by reading the documentation. But for the most part, you'll probably find yourself only making a few basic adjustments for exposure, color balance, shadow and highlight adjustments, as well as sharpening. And depending on the sophistication of the software, you may also see adjustments for such things as noise reduction, lens corrections, and grayscale conversion. In essence, when you process a RAW file, you're manually making the adjustments to the image that you or your camera manufacturer would have delegated to the camera when shooting a JPEG. But you have the advantage of maintaining all the original data for future use. The most common default file format is the JPEG. JPEG is an acronym for the Joint Photographic Experts Group who developed the format. It uses a form of lossy compression to store the digital information. That means it compresses and throws away some of the information. With most cameras, you can adjust the amount of compression when you select the file size. The smaller the file, the more the compression. In the day of limited recording media and processing power, small file size was a factor. However, with high capacity cards and faster computers, that's no longer necessary. Every camera manufacturer uses its own scheme for creating a JPEG. So Canon, Nikon, Sony decide on what information to throw away and what to keep, depending on how they're processing the image for sharpening and color balance and so forth. Usually this is based on some style setting that you can select. So if you hear people arguing about what camera has the best image and they're comparing JPEGs, they're really arguing more about how the camera processed the image. My image looks sharper than yours is more than likely the amount of noise reduction and sharpening that a particular manufacturer applied during processing. And this may or may not correspond to the actual quality of the image capture. A JPEG file is a very universal file recognized by all applications and it'll probably be around for a long time. So files stored in this format will have a long life. One very important factor to keep in mind when editing JPEGs. Every time you resave the file, it gets compressed. You shrink the file even more. It's different than just opening the file and then closing it. If you open the file and lighten it or crop it, when you resave it as a JPEG, you're going to be throwing away more information than the image will continue to degrade. So in run respect, it's a dead-end format. Here are two different examples. 
The first image is a raw image saved off as a TIFF file. You could open and resave this file as a TIFF over and over again and it wouldn't degrade. However, let's look at what happens with the image if it was saved and resaved as a JPEG. Notice the degradation from one generation to the next. Finally, compare the last generation of JPEG with the initial file. When editing an image, you should always be working and saving in a lossless format like a TIFF file. If you work in Photoshop like I do, then you're more than likely going to save off as a PSD. The PSD format is Adobe's native lossless format that allows you to save additional information for certain Photoshop features. However, keep in mind if there's no Adobe, you might have a useless file. On the other hand, TIFF files are universal and will probably be around as long as a JPEG. So how good does the image have to be? For some modelers, maybe only as good as the intended destination. If all you need is a little thumbnail, then virtually everything I've talked about so far may not matter to you. You might be happy with the image off your phone. If it's just a snapshot for a form board, you might be satisfied with the JPEG that you process in your camera. But if you want something more polished, you're doing a construction article, writing a blog or a magazine article, you're going to want all you can get. After all, you can always throw information away as long as you hang on to the original file. However, you might want to consider the bigger picture. If you're going to be putting any image out of your model for public consumption, why not put your best foot forward? The model that you spent so many hours on deserves a proper showcase. So take your time with the setup and record the image in the best possible way available to you. The next video in this series will be about the camera and what hardware capabilities help capture the most useful images for scale modeling. Following that, I'll be looking at maximizing depth of field, color management, lighting, and finally image editing.